Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody. If I uh, seem to sound a little different and speak a little different tonight, that's because we're broadcasting on both Facebook and YouTube. So I will be addressing Facebook and YouTube. So please spread the word let other people know that we are on Facebook and YouTube as well. And we are live on both. Let us go to our Father in prayer. God, our Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to come before you once more and again. Father, we ask you to touch our hearts, souls, and mind. Speak to me, speak through me, that we may be uplifted and sharing in your word. Feed us this evening, Father. Protect us like the good shepherd. You are the resurrection. You are the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father other than through you. Now, Lord, instruct my tongue to teach. Instruct our hearts to listen and learn. In the name of Yeshua HaMasiah. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, Christine, Jennifer, how you doing? Who else do we have here? Good evening, Hank. How are you doing? Sister Jackson, how you doing? All right, all right, all right. Now, like I said earlier, we are both uh, Facebook Live and YouTube Live tonight. So we're going to try to kill two birds with one stone, and let's keep the uh, conversation as lively as possible. I thank you all for being here, and I'm looking forward to an uh, uplifting lesson. All right, so tonight's lesson is The Last Frontier. The Last Frontier. And it's coming out of uh, Philippians 1, 19 through 30. And before we get to that, let's see what the author had to say that put this together to get us prepared to go forward. He writes, I'm about to celebrate my 50th birthday. An aging population, loud voices promoting assisted suicide, skyrocketing health costs, and widely publicized near-death experiences have made us as a society more and more anxious about death. What we want to know is what happens after we die. A lot of people will tell you what they think will happen or what they heard will happen to someone else. But there's not enough for me. That's not enough for me. When I stand beside a fresh grave and face the final passage myself, I want more than somebody, someone's experience or speculation to hold on to. I want truth. The only reliable source of information about that, and it comes, and what comes after it is the Bible. That's because only one reliable witness has passed through death and come back to tell about it, and that's Jesus Christ. So, what accounts of near death or after death experience have you had or have you read about? And what's been your response to those accounts?
would have been your near-death or after-death experiences that you heard or read about? And what did you think about those? My first near-death experience happened when I was nine years old. I got hit by a car going about 45, 50 miles per hour. And uh, that was an experience for the ages, you know. And then again, I had another near-death experience when I was 12 years old. Uh, my appendix ruptured and um, he wasn't sure if I was going to make it through. The doctors were uh, doing what they did. What's up? Um, What's up? Hey, man. Um, so I had a couple near-death experiences before I was even 15 years old, which would tell me, and if you think about it, when Jesus was on the boat on his way to the Gadarenes, it was Satan trying to stop him from being someplace at an appointed time. I fortunately haven't had any of this, but I read about that's one breath, breathtaking and, and humbling. All right, all right, breathtaking and humbling. Sometimes a near-death experience is something trying to delay you from becoming who you truly are or doing a mission that God has set before you. And I was saying, the storm rose in, in the sea on the way to gatherings, and that was an attempt to keep Jesus from casting legion out of that young man that was in the catacombs. So I would tell you when I was nine years old getting hit by a car and then 12 years old and then serving active duty in the military, being in some situations that weren't necessarily the best for me, that um, I had some experiences that were trying to prevent me from reaching my full potential in Christ. It's breathtaking and I'm with anybody else. Nobody else? Jesus told the thief beside him that he would be with him. That says it all for me. All right. All right. All right. So, then on a personal level, consider how long you think you may live. How long do you think you may live? And ask God to use and ask God to use this study to prepare you to face what's coming in life and death with confidence. That's kind of a I mean it's reality. We've talked about death more than once and we know that death is part of the life cycle and since, thank you, and since death is part of the life cycle, ask God to prepare you. Death is going to or has already affected all of us one way or another. And if it hasn't affected you recently, it's going to affect us soon. Getting stabbed. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound good at all, Quincy. That doesn't sound good at all. All right. So, knowing that we all gonna, we all have an appointed time, and we're gonna have to deal with it. So let's use today's lesson and ask God to prepare us to face life and death with confidence. So, seeing that, let's look at uh, our old friend, the Apostle Paul. He found himself being pulled in two directions. On one hand, he wanted to live so he can continue his work proclaiming the gospel and nurturing new Christians. 
All right. All right, Sister J, got it. Then, on the other hand, he had a desire to tug at his heart. There were days when he wanted to untie the rope in this life and set sails for heaven's shore. I'm pretty sure we've all gone through that one time or another, just like, feel like giving up. Enough is enough. We see everything that happens. We feel the emotions. We feel the pressures of daily living. And, you know, uh, sometimes we just like forget it. I think someone who knows you sure will not see death, but I don't know when he's coming. I think you're right. I think you, the uh, sentiment that your husband made was, I'll be with you in paradise. I think you're right. All right. So, um, Philippians 1, 19 through 30. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all I will not be at all ashamed, but it will be the full courage is not always Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, if I choose, and I cannot tell, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to, is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that in me you have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, side by side, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but your salvation but of your salvation that is from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but you should also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that I saw, that you saw, I had, and now hear that, I'm still, that I still have. So, Paul was writing from another jail cell, Paul was writing from another jail cell, and he was convinced. He knew that he would be vindicated by the prayers of the saints and from the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. No matter what came against him, he was going to be fine. If he lived, he was okay. If he was died, he, if he died, he was even happy. He had eager expectations. He was looking forward to it, and he said he will not be ashamed about anything in his life and ministry but will proclaim Christ with all courage. Now, if we know anything about Paul's stature, we know Paul wasn't a big man at all. Paul was a little fella, but he had the heart of a lion. Anybody that tried to persecute all the churches in, any, in, 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 in Israel, all around Israel, had to have a lot of gumption. Because of his love and his commitment to Christ, Paul's main concern is that Christ will be highly honored, whether by life or death. Christ must be honored, whether in life or death. Our life should reflect our divine DNA that reflects our life in Christ. When we die, what we have done should speak for itself. Without a hint of exaggeration, Paul writes... For me to live in Christ and to die is gain. If I live, if I live, it's in Christ. But if I die, that means I gain. I'm going home. 
We talked about last, we talked about Monday in my father's house and that many mansions, many rooms. Paul was trying to get his reservation filled soon. Paul was trying to go home. Paul's purpose was to glorify Jesus no matter what came. Whether it was death or whether it was in life, he was going to glorify Christ. The Lord Jesus was his consuming focus. He even admits his desire to part and go home. Each day is a gift. No one is promised tomorrow. We should live each day like it's our last. I would want to be explaining to God while I was doing some shady. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, well, see, Lord, it was like this. See, what had happened was, <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that. He even misses desire to depart and go be with Christ. Paul was ready to go. It was far better to be with Christ than remain alive in a fallen world. Could you imagine Paul living today with us? And he was calling the world he lived in fallen. Could you imagine him living in a world like today? Nevertheless, he knew that he had a job to do and he had to remain in the flesh that he could continue to minister to the Philipp Philippian believers so they could grow. And he knew it required sacrifice in order for him to contribute to that spiritual growth of other people and for them to be able to boast in Christ. All right? He was willing to lay down his life for the Philippians. Paul was simply following the example that he had been set by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when you look at verse 20, 27, Paul wants to make sure the Philippian believers will honor Christ no matter what happens. No matter what happens. Whether I come and see you or I'm absent. He don't know what his future holds. He don't know if they're going to put him to death or they're going to set him free. He just knows he's in jail. But he wants them to be strong and contend for the faith. No matter what happens. That Christ may get the glory. It's crucial that the church stands united. Because if it's divided, it will disrupt the flow and the spreading of the gospel. And they would not be able to stand and contend together, contending together for the faith. If we take one chord, it's okay. But if we take three chords and we put them together, that chord becomes much stronger and harder to break. So, not to be frightened in any way by their opposition, courage is crucial, crucial to the gospel witness. Paul says the Philippians... Christians should be unashamed witnesses and it's a sign of their destruct the destruction of their poems because they were fearless and not scared they had what it take what it took to stand against the opposition that was coming their way and also it showed that they were strong and they had steadfastness steadfastness in their own salvation which had all come from God and we look at verse 29 Suffering is something that we all have to go through. It's something we all going to do. Christ did it. Are we any better than Christ? Shake your head, no. We know better than our master. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. So if we pick up our cross and follow him, we're going to suffer just like he did. And we're going to suffer for him. And it's with a purpose that it gives Christ the glory. Take a stand for the gospel and love and truth regardless to the repercussions but we know we're going to get repercussions there are people that's going to stand against us there's people going to really kill us there's people going to talk about us no matter what we're doing if we're doing it in the name of jesus and it gives jesus the glory glorification somebody's got a problem with it. somebody's got a problem with it. so knowing this about paul how would y'all describe paul's attitude while he was in jail. How would you describe Paul's attitude as he was writing this letter to the Philippians?
What would Brother Hank's attitude be, Sister Carla, Sister Jackson? What was it? What's his attitude like? He prefers to be with Christ, but understand that he still has work to do in this world. I'll stay if I got to. Now, since I got to be here, I'll be here. But I'm telling you, I'd rather be at home with you. What would your attitude be in a situation like that? He was trying to encourage them to keep up the good work. All right. All right. It seems like a nevertheless moment for him. If I live or if I die, I'm okay. I'm going to be with my Savior. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be with my Savior no matter what. If I live, I'm in Christ. If I die, I gain because I'm right by it. Amen, Sister Jackson. All right, so do most people today think that death brings gain? Explain the answer. Do most people today think that death brings gain? What do we get out of dying? <laughs> what do we get out of dying? Well, what do most people think we get out of dying? If we talk to the average person on the street, what do they say that we get from dying? Have y'all heard the saying, he who has the most toys at the end wins? Don't have to deal with people. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Oh. Amen. Many different things, it depends. Peace and the suffering from this human life. All right. Yeah, but what do most people think? Y'all peculiar people. Y'all God's children. Y'all got divine DNA. Y'all know where y'all going. Y'all know that there's been a room set up for you, and all you got to do is wait to go get in your room and be in the mansion and get paid. Payday is coming. But what about folks that don't know what you know, who don't believe like you believe? What about folks that don't accept Christ as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? How have some people expressed themselves to you, their thoughts about death? If we're talking about money, then one can get, if we're talking about material, then one can get money, property, etc. Okay. Okay. So you're talking about receiving your inheritance from somebody else dying here on earth. All right. 
That's one way to look at it. Someone passes, whatever they have willed to you comes to you. Okay, so that's one way to gain things. That's what people look about. Yep. It's the end of everything. There's nothing else. They just put you in the ground and throw some dirt on you, or they stick you in the furnace and burn you up, and it's done. But obviously, we don't believe that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here together tonight. It's like turn off the TV. Wow. Turn off the TV, come back, turn it on later, got a new program. Okay. That's a good analogy. Some people actually think that. And in a sense, that's true. If they don't believe in Christ, they'll turn off the TV here, they'll go to heaven for a minute, and they're going to wake up, and they're going to be looking at a, different, a whole different scenery. A whole different set of scenery. Dante's Inferno describes seven levels of hell. Now, I don't know how true that is, but that's Dante's Inferno. That's a book. They describe seven levels of hell. So, you know, are you a level one or level seven hellion? So you turn off the TV and you wake up in hell and you got a, you got a new episode. You're absolutely right. <laughs> All right. What responsibilities kept Paul linked to this life? What was, what was Paul's mindset about his mission here on earth? Look at verse 22, 25, and 26. Verse 22 says, If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I would choose, I cannot tell. And then we go to verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So what was keeping Paul tied to this world? What was keeping Paul connected to not going home? He had work to do sharing Christ with the lost. Amen. His flock. Many people today are turned off by Yeshua because they had bad representation. Oh, okay. Paul was setting the bar. I like that. Paul was setting the bar. Paul was setting the bar. So his expectation of the Philippians were to be strong and contend for the faith. How? With one accord, unified, so they could take on the opposition. And that is setting the bar. Amen. What was his expectations of being with Christ? Verse 
And that's what we should all do, set a bar of Christ-like life. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. So, the word depart in verse 23 means it was used in Paul's day to picture a ship being untied from the dock and setting sail for a new destination. If we view death in this light, does it make it more po a more positive experience or a more uncertain experience and why? Being with Christ is all gay. Amen. Amen, Brother Hank. Y'all went quiet on me. If we view if we view death as a trip, if we view death as a trip, is it a more positive experience or a more uncertain one? Why? Think about it. If you ever been on a trip, if you ever been any place, and you didn't well, even if you drive yourself, you made preparations to go on that trip. First off, you knew where you were going, for me positive, for others it would depend on the destination. <laughs> Amen, Hank. And, and that's what I was getting to. If we buy tickets, if we go to the airport, we go to the shipyard, we go to the travel agent, we buy a ticket, we are buying a ticket for a particular destination. And we have expectations of what's going to happen when we get to that destination. So, if I bought a ticket, and I said I was going to um, some place I'll probably never go, Bali, <laughs> where they got nothing but beautiful beaches and breezes blow nice all day, what is my expectation when I get there? To sit on the beach with a coconut? with a nice drink in it, with a straw, and just being relaxed. Now, I grew up in the Chicago area. If I'm going home to Chicago, I'm packing my pistol. I'm avoiding certain areas when I get there because I know what to expect when I get there. If I fly, I know I'm not taking a bus from the airport to anywhere. I'm not getting on the L train. I'm going to be very, very careful about taking a taxi because I know what to expect when I get there. And like Hank said, it depends on the destination. If you know you going, like Paul was certain that he was going to heaven, he was going to be with Jesus, you'll pack up quick. But if you're uncertain, you, you, you know, it's like me going back to Chicago. How long am I staying? Why am I here? When can I leave? Who do I need to see while I'm here? Amen. Paul seemed so, so certain about what, was, what would happen at death. What was his sense of security based on? What was Paul's sense of security based on?
Oh, just imagine you on the road to Damascus and a bright light shine in your face and knock you off the horse that you were riding on and a boy spoke out to you and asked you, uh, Hank, why are you persecuting me? What kind of assurance would that give you? Bessie, why are you persecuting me? Jennifer, why are you persecuting me? Quincy, why are you persecuting me? What kind of sense of security would that give you? Christ's resurrection proved him to be, to come, yes, Yeshua blinded him, so he had his full, full attention. He knows Yeshua. When I see Jesus, amen, all my troubles and headaches will soon be over. All right? So, in other words, from Paul's first conversion, there was a relationship. From the time Jesus decided to stop him from going to Damascus, send him to go see the prophet to get his eyes healed, there was a relationship. Paul did all he could to hurt that relationship. Yet Christ loved Paul so much that he opened his eyes by blinding him. Have you ever felt blinded only to realize that God has opened your eyes? Have you been sitting high on the hall or in Paul's case, sitting high on the horse and find yourself on the ground looking up, saying, Lord. Brought down in order to be lifted up. That sounds like love to me. And I think that's where Paul's reassurance was in the fact that he blinded me, then he sent me to be cured. There's no power greater in the universe than that. Now, Christ's resurrection proved him to be, proved to him what was to come, blinded him, he got his full attention. I think he's got all of our attention, mm -hmm. maybe not all of our full attention, but he's got our attention. Some of us, he's got our full attention. Because we done been through some things that we know that can't nobody do this but the Lord. I've done everything I could. I, 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 that's it. If God don't do it, it won't be done. So he has our full attention. So with that said, Hank, do you feel the same assurance when you think about your own death? Why, why not? Carla, Bessie, Jennifer, Quincy. I'm going to tell you, yeah, I believe. I believe I'm one with Christ, one in Christ with the infinite creator, the most high. Mostly because God's not a man. He can't lie. He said, if I believe, and I believe, I'm confessing Jesus is Lord. I'm confessing. That he died on the cross. He shed his blood for the remission of my sin. And the salvation of my soul. I'm confessing. What gives you that reassurance? What gives you that assurance of your death? That's not a rhetorical question. 
I want to hear from y'all. What's your reassurance or your lack of assurance? I know for sure that I'll be with him. That's a comfort I have in Jesus. Amen. I know for sure that I will be with him, and that's a comfort I have in Jesus. There's only one person that know. That's you. Absolutely. Oh, he sat me down at my worst when I hated him. He loves me. When I fall, my daddy is there to pick me up. Amen. 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 Yes, I believe we will see him again soon. All right. What spiritual legacy did Paul want to leave in the lives of these Christmas? What was he trying to teach them to do? Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that is from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but you should suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here I still have. What was Paul asking fellow workmen and women of the gospel to do? Somebody reading a lesson ahead of time. So what legacy do you want for your family and your friends? My guess would be the same thing. You want the same for your family and friends that Paul wanted for the Christians that he was working with, trying to get them to stand strong in the faith with one accord and continue to spread the gospel that it may glorify Christ. So, what can you do to strengthen the positive impact you have on those around you? What can you do to strengthen the positive impact you have on those around you? How can you help somebody continue to grow? How can you help somebody get stronger in their walk with Christ? Those that are around you, how can you help them? We're doing two of them right now. We're doing two things right now. First thing is study. 
Keep your sword oil and sharp. Keep your sword oil and sharp. So that you can rightly divide the word of God. And the second, encourage them. Okay, encourage them to know you're sure, you mean it intimately. Amen. And that's exactly what my next point was. Iron sharpened iron. Or as Paul said, be with one accord. Standing side by side. What are we doing right now? Socially distanced. We are side by side studying, learning more of Yeshua. We are strengthening one another to be able to keep our swords sharpened and oiled so that we can face the opposition when we have to. And if we need be, I can call Hank. Hank can go into his prayer room with me and we can pray. And we can send 10,000 devils to flight. I want to love them and serve them the way you sure would. I pray, I pray my family knows him before they leave this world. I want them to recognize he is the reason for my life. He's the reason my life has changed. But they don't see him. Pray for them. Love them and talk to them. Amen. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Remember earlier, I said one chord is strong, but if we have three chords wrapped together, it becomes three times as strong and harder to break. So as long as we are bound together, we are stronger. We are stronger. One of us can send 10,000 devils to flight. All four of us, that's 40. Easy. That's easy. Anybody have anything else that they want to add? Pastor, you want to review? Amen. It's just a... I like this lesson and when you look at it and realize that this is life today. Uh, 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 these particular scriptures, let me ask you uh, in, in, in this way. How many of you is going to write a letter? And you done went over it and find out there's nothing wrong with that letter. But instead of mailing it, you're going to erase everything you did and throw it away. When we look at these scriptures tonight, I, I, you can see that Paul is saying, that I, I'm, I'm doing good works. That Christ shall be magnified uh, uh, in my body. Because of the things that I'm doing, Christ shall be magnified. But when we begin to go out and work for Christ, we always find somebody that's going to damper our spirits. And then we begin to drift the other way of why do I want to talk to them. But then we wake up and basically when you look, the same thing is going on right here. Paul knows that he is magnifying the Lord. But because of his situation, he's confused. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm betwixt having the desire to depart 
and to be with Christ, which is far better. We as Christians, we as believers, let me put it that way, uh, as believers in Christ, knowing that we have a mansion, but as you've probably heard before, our Father don't need any help. Here between two opinions, and we get folks that way, that's between two opinions, do I want to be here or do I want to go ahead and be with my Father? I, if the Lord ain't called you, that means you didn't commit suicide. Our Father don't need our help to get us where He wants us to be. We need to continue to work, to do what He had asked us to do here, right here. We go through trials and tribulations. Uh, it's, it's not an easy road. Uh, think about Jesus. They talked about him. They put him through false trials. They sat there and tried to stone him and, and spit on him, put crowns in his head, little thorns all in his head, but he stood the test of time. Paul realized that he has to stand the test of time. You being a child of God, you doing everything that you're supposed to do. But understand that when we decide to take things in our own hands, everything that you stood for just got erased. But when we walk to the end, when we allow our Father to call us when He's ready, then the world, your family, your friends, can honestly stand and say that. That was a child of God. They worked to the end. We all get between two opinions every once in a while. Times get hard. Man, I, I, I'm just tired of this ugly, barren land. I'm ready to go home. But our Father, He's not ready for you just yet. He'll call you. It's not like going to uh, the, the Grandma's house or, or, or Mama's house with your little suitcase and and then going to turn around and say, well, I'm going to go back and try it again. No, ain't no go back. We, we, we got one shot. We're going to mess up. We're going to derail. But there's always a way to get back on track. To do the things that he has designed for us to do. That is what Paul is going here and he's saying. Paul, when you go through these simple scriptures. And you can see Paul's faith. Then he goes in and he witness and lets you know what's going on. And he go back into his faith and the witness. We need to exercise our faith. The series that we are working on right now is, is giving uh, uh, hopefully giving each and every one the tools and the knowledge that we're working to make it to heaven. So if, if you uh, uh, stay tuned, listen to us, uh, uh, read for yourself, ask the questions that you need to ask uh, uh, so that Every last one of us will be able to hear the words.
come in, my good and faithful servant. So we pray that all of y'all got something out of this. Let the Lord use you. Stand boldly. And just watch it work through you. God bless you all. Amen. All right. Our next lesson will be next Wednesday. We're going to have our Bible study Monday. We're going to let y'all enjoy Labor Day. So we'll be back Wednesday, and we'll be the lesson will be Rapture Ahead, and we'll be coming out of First Thessalonians chapter four, verse thirteen through eighteen. Rapture Ahead, First Thessalonians chapter four, thirteen through eighteen. All hearts and minds clear? A reminder, Sunday morning, 945, we will have Sunday school. We will have Sunday school, 945 Sunday morning. Let me write that down for y'all. Write it down for myself too. Beginning next Sunday, first Sunday. And Sunday is Communion Sunday. All right? All hearts and minds clear. Let us go to our Father in prayer. God, our Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for opening our hearts, souls, and minds to receive of you. Thank you for touching, delivering, and lifting us up, Father, that we may be one with you, connected to the true vine prune us that we may give more fruit as we get prepared to move to the room in the mansion that you have prepared for us. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen, amen, and amen. Good night, all. Good night.